And so I'd like to get started with our afternoon session. Um, and to kick that off, I'm, go I'm going to introduce to you Rachel Atchison, who is the Deputy Strategist with the Borough President's Office. Many of you probably know Rachel, but she is a real superpower in the plant-based world. She's an amazing organizer, and we're thrilled to have her. Rachel. So I get the wonderful pleasure of introducing a true rock star in the movement, I moved to New York City about two years ago, and when I moved here, I was told that there was a doctor I needed to meet upon moving, and he would be my top priority. So, you all get to see a wonderful presentation by Dr. Robert Osfeld. He is a cardiologist, the director of preventative cardiology, the founder and director of the Cardiac Wellness Program at Montefiore Health System, and an associate professor of medicine at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Without further ado, Dr. Robert Osfeld. Thank you so much, Rachel. It's, uh, can you all hear me in the back? Okay. If you stop hearing me, just wave or something. Let's see if this. Oh, good. I don't have to do Dr. Katz kind of gyrations. And I, I don't know, I felt, uh, I don't know, I felt this pressure after Dr. Rosenfeld's talk to like do my talk topless or something. <laughs> But, but then I thought about it a little bit more, and I'm like, I'm going to spare you guys that. So, uh, so it's a real honor and pleasure to be here with you all. And I mean, it's just incredible to see the energy and passion that you have for nutrition and health here in Brooklyn and just how forward thinking uh, SUNY Downstate is. So it's really, it's really amazing. So we're going to talk about a plant-based diet and your heart. So um, I got to participate in a debate at the American College of Cardiology conference um, uh, a couple weeks ago, and it was between plant-based diet and Mediterranean and keto. So I'm going to take a little bit of that talk and, and bring it here today. So we'll be talking a bit about a plant-based diet, a Mediterranean-style diet, compare that to a plant-based diet, a ketogenic diet, compare that to a plant-based diet, and we'll make some conclusions. So, um, when we're talking about a plant-based diet, what do I mean? I basically mean it, it excludes or nearly excludes all animal products. If it has a face or comes from something with a face, don't eat it. That's what we mean. So uh, it includes tons of vegetables, fruits, whole grains. And I stress whole grains uh, because it's minimally processed. Like none of us think that sugar and white bread is healthy. So truly whole grains. Uh, beans, lentils, yams, etc. So the only dietary pattern that I know of that's been shown to reverse cholesterol blockages in the blood vessels that feed the heart with blood is a plant-based diet. And so in this great study by Dr. Ornish, who Dr. Katz spoke a good bit about, uh, he took people with stable cholesterol blockages in their heart and he randomized them into two groups. Group number one was almost exclusively a plant-based diet, but they had some, a little bit of no-fat no dairy in there, and um, psychosocial support and exercise. And the other group was expert care from people just like me, cardiologists. Guess which group won? So the group, of course, that had the healthier lifestyle, their cholesterol blockages shrunk, and those taken care of by cardiologists like me, cholesterol blockages grew. And that just kept on going. After one year, after five years, it kept on going. And the group that was treated by the expert cardiologist had, about, had a higher odds of having a cardiovascular event, like a heart attack or stroke, after five years. And this diet, of course, or this lifestyle pattern, it's dose-dependent, which is important, uh, because the more people did it, the closer that they live to this healthier lifestyle, the more the cholesterol blockage is shrunk. And that's important because when there's a dose-response relationship, we think it's an even more powerful thing. And other studies have supported a similar kind of relationship. So, okay, a plant-based diet can potentially reverse coronary disease, but also improves risk factors for coronary disease, among other kinds of diseases. So CRP, inflammation, is the big catchword these days. Well, in a randomized study, taking people with stable cholesterol blockages, they randomized them to a vegan diet versus the American Heart Association diet. And guess which one won? 
The vegan diet reduced inflammation significantly more. LDL cholesterol, the higher the levels in your blood, the worse that we do. And we know that if we lower those levels, people do better. So in a very interesting randomized controlled trial, they looked at a cholesterol lowering drug, and they also looked at a plant-based dietary pattern. And they both lowered cholesterol to a very similar degree. So a plant-based diet can lower cholesterol levels about as much as a statin. And cholesterol particles can become particularly irritating to your blood vessels when they become oxidized. And they become particularly irritating then like a splinter. Well, that process in your body of oxidizing the LDL particles is more difficult when you eat a vegetarian diet versus an omnivorous diet. Blood pressure, another risk factor. Blood pressure is lower in those who eat more plant-based nutrition. And in a really cool study, the CARDIA study, the Coronary Artery Risk Determinants in Youth Study, they found that the people who ate more and more plant-based nutri uh, plant foods were significantly less likely to develop high blood pressure. And this theme continues with other large epidemiologic studies. There's another cool risk factor, not cool, I guess, but it's called lipoprotein little a, and that attaches to cholesterol particles. And it really increases the risk of having a heart attack, stroke, but there's not a lot we can do about it. Medication doesn't really do quite that much yet. There's some on the horizon, we shall see. But an interesting study of plant-based diets by Dr. Baxter Montgomery, he significantly lowered lipoprotein little a levels with a dietary intervention. So novel risk factors. So, okay, it improves risk factors we're more familiar with. And a novel risk factor is a plant-based diet, as Dr. Katz is mentioning, can improve gene, gene expression. So uh, Dr. Ornish took about 30, young, uh, 30 people with early stage prostate cancer, and he put them in his healthier lifestyle, which includes largely plant-based nutrition and he biopsied the prostate before and after. And after about three months, dozens of anti-cancer genes were upregulated in their expression, and many pro-cancer genes were downregulated in their expression. So we can't change our genes, but we can change which ones speak, making the healthier ones speak more loudly and the unhealthy ones speak more softly. And so that's pretty cool. You can turn on and off on the healthy genes, off the unhealthy genes with healthier lifestyle. And as was mentioned, that on and off switch, at least in animal models, gets passed on to our kids and grandkids. So the healthier lifestyle choices you make today not only impacts your health and the health of the environment, but may very well impact gene expression in your kids and your grandkids. It's an incredible responsibility gene expression. The microbiome, that's the new kid on the block, gets tons of attention, and it's critically important. We each have about a trillion bacteria hanging out with us in our guts. So you could really say that we're the parasites, not them. Uh, but we live, we can live in harmony with them. And it turns out they can promote lots of healthful activities within our bodies. And when you eat more plant-based nutrition with more fiber, that promotes a healthier gut microbiome. And that change in animal models can happen even within a day, and humans maybe up to about five days. But you can significantly change the population of the microbiome to be much more healthful. For example, when you eat more plant-based plant foods with fiber, that fiber makes it to the gut microbiome, and the microbiome makes something called short-chain fatty acids. Who cares? Well, short-chain fatty acids are helpful for you. They go in and they interact with the cells that line the inner wall of the colon. And when they do that, those cells um, can reduce gene expression that leads to cholesterol formation. So those cells can make less cholesterol. It can reduce inflammation. It can reduce oxidative stress all the kinds of things you want to have happen less. And when it gets more of that short chain fatty acid, it makes a little bit more of, of this mucus layer that coats the inner wall 
of our colon. And, that, and then the microbiome hangs out right next to it. And you want that little mucus layer because it keeps them separated just a little bit. You don't want them touching. Because if they touch, the body sees the microbiome as an attacker or something foreign, foreign and it creates this big, immune, this big immune reaction and it attacks it. And then when that happens, it can kill off some of that bacteria, creating more inflammation, potentially promoting diabetes, and in animal models, promoting atherosclerosis, more cholesterol disease. So, okay, um, genes, microbiome, MMP, that's metallic, uh, matrix metalloproteinases. Those promote atherosclerosis, promote cholesterol disease, promote heart attacks. Well, your body will have less of them when you um, eat, when you have a vegetarian style diet versus an omnivorous style diet. Another novel risk factor, endothelial progenitor cells. Now, our body turns itself over over time. Our skin does, our bones do, our hearts do, and our bone marrow makes these things called progenitor cells that goes out and replaces older cells, just like the endothelial cells. The endothelial cells line the inner wall of our arteries like a wallpaper, and we want to treat them well. But sometimes they get older and they need to be replaced. So the more endothelial progenitor cells you have in your blood, the better you do. And it turns out that in a randomized control trial, they had young Okinawan women eat the regular diet versus the regular diet plus more green leafy vegetables. And when they ate more green leafy vegetables, they made more endothelial progenitor cells. How about a plant-based diet and diabetes? Well, in this interesting randomized trial, they took people with diabetes and randomized them to either a plant-based diet versus the American Diabetes Association diet. Guess which one won? Well, the plant-based diet, they lowered their, their medications more, their, their sugar levels fell numerically more, they lost more weight, and their cholesterol levels fell more. Okay, but okay, that's a randomized trial. There's cool epidemiology or population-based studies that find the same thing, that the more toward plant-based nutrition you eat, the less likely you are to have diabetes across multiple populations across the world. So this is a wonderful study done by Dr. Satija. And what they asked is, if you eat more healthful foods, is that good? Is it not good? So they created, they looked at this healthy diet index. And that when you, eating more vegetables, fruits, whole grains, you were higher up on the healthy food index. And eating more of other products, you were not. So if you look here, this is the plant-based diet index. And this is hazard ratio for coronary heart disease. So this is the plant-based diet index. And as that increases more and more and more, people did better. Their hazard for a heart attack went down. But the devil is often in the details, because like you could eat sugar cookies and white bread all day and be plant-based, or you could eat kale all day and be plant-based. There's clearly a difference. So they broke that down. That red line is the healthy plant-based diet index. And this gray line up here is an unhealthy plant-based diet index. And you can see if you ate healthily, you did even better, and unhealthily, you did even worse. However, this yellow line here, this is the healthy plant-based food. So the more of that you ate, the better you did. And then they compared it to animal-based foods and less healthy plant-based foods. And the animal foods included chicken and fish. If you ate more animal foods, you did worse. But if you ate an unhealthy plant-based diet, you did even numerically a little bit worse. So the devil is indeed in the details. But this reinforces how eating a plant-based diet and the more plants you eat, the better you do. Um, along the lines of plant-based nutrition, and is, there's similar data with diabetes. And then along those lines, in a big meta-analysis, looking at over 800,000 people, um, each serving of extra fruit and vegetables per day was associated with a 5% lower risk of death. And in the health surveys for England study, they followed about 65,000 people for a little over seven years, and each increasing serving of fruit and vegetables per day was associated with living longer. Now, this great study by Dr. Song, they looked at over 100,000 people with 3.5 million person years of follow-up. 
And they asked, if you replace just 3% of your calories from animal-based foods with 3% of calories from plant-based foods, is it good? Is it not good? What happens? Well, it turns out it's good. So if you replace just 3% of your calories from processed red meat with 3% of calories from plant-based foods, that's associated with a 34% lower hazard of death. Unprocessed red meat, 12%. Poultry, 6%. Fish, 6%. Eggs, 19 Dairy, 8%. All significant. And I mean, you all probably know that the World Health Organization has recently come out and said that processed red meats are a class one carcinogen. And that means it causes cancer. Um, that, and a class one carcinogen, that's the same category that plutonium is in, by the way. So a plant-based diet is the only dietary pattern that has been shown to reverse coronary disease. It improves multiple risk factors, CRP, inflammation, LDL, oxidized LDL, blood pressure, lipoprotein little a, diabetes. It improves novel risk factors, and it is associated with living longer. Okay, so how about a Mediterranean-style diet? Now, a Mediterranean-style diet is a, is a very good diet. It's largely vegetables and fruits. It's a very good diet. If my patients said, you know, I, I'm, I don't want to go plant-based, but I'll go Mediterranean, I'll take it. Hey, I don't want perfection to be my, what my idea of perfection is to be the enemy of good. So a Mediterranean-style diet is very good for both secondary and primary prevention. Lyon diet heart study looked at people after heart attacks, and the Pre-Med study looked at people without heart attacks. And if they, went plant, if they went Mediterranean, they did better than a controlled diet, which was a typical Western diet. I mean, shocker, typical Western diet is not so great, but a Mediterranean-style diet really is quite healthful. But it appears that under the umbrella of a Mediterranean-style diet, the more plant-based you go, the better you do. So in this uh, a priori defined post hoc analysis of the PREDIMED study, they looked at about 7,000 people and they asked if during the study, if you had a pro-vegetarian di um, diet pattern, uh, meaning, meaning eating lots of vegetables and fruits and avoiding animal products, including fish and chicken, was that good or not good? Well, it turns out it was good because the highest quintile versus the lowest was associated with a 41% lower hazard of death, meaning the more of a pro-vegetarian pattern you ate under the umbrella of a Mediterranean-style diet, the better you did. And in the EPIC cohort study, for every standard deviation increase in fruit and vegetable consumption, you had a 14% reduction in mortality. So in the Greek EPIC prospective cohort study, where they ate largely a Mediterranean-style diet, they, they found in 23,000 people that if you had a higher Mediterranean diet score, meaning the more of a Mediterranean-style diet you ate, the better you did. That's great, a Mediterranean-style diet is a healthful diet, but they're like, well, okay, let's look at how we define the score and what aspects of the score accounted for the benefit. So, all right, moderate alcohol, that was associated with improvement. The, the benefit was driven by that. It was also driven by low meat consumption, driven by high fruit and nut consumption, high vegetable consumption, high monounsaturated to saturated fat ratio, meaning more plant-based foods, high legume consumption, cereal and dairy, minimal impact, and fish and seafood had a trend toward harm. So in this analysis, going more plant-based also appeared to be better. This is the Seventh-day Adventists. They treat their bodies like temples. And they have multiple healthy dietary patterns. But in this analysis of over 60,000 people, you can see they looked at different dietary patterns. They looked at non-vegetarians, semi-vegetarians, pesco-vegetarians, lacto-ovo-vegetarians, and vegans. And they looked at the percent with diabetes. The group with the lowest was the vegans. And just to highlight, these are the pesco-vegetarians right here. So a Mediterranean-style diet is a very good diet, but it appears that the more plant-based one goes under the umbrella of a Mediterranean-style diet, the better one does based on clinical and mechanistic studies. So the ketogenic or the low-carb diet, I think, is largely based on a popular myth. And the popular myth is that we were told in 1980 or so to eat low-fat, and then we ate low-fat, and look at us now, we're fat and sick. Okay? Well, we may have been told to eat low-fat, but we didn't do that. We ate more of everything. So it's fake news. I, th I think it's a, it's a compelling narrative, but I think it's fake news. So no long-living society lives in a state of chronic ketosis. 
Now there's a romanticized notion that the Inuit population, they live very, very far north, circumpolar, uh, do. But first of all, their outcomes, their longevity is about the same as the typical population in Canada. So there's nothing particularly health magical about that. But, and they eat a lot of, of fish and fish blubber because of where they live. But they've also selected for a mutation that makes it even harder for them to go into ketosis suggesting that being in that state for a chronic period of time may not be healthful. But then if you step back and you look at the longest living populations in the world, the blue zones, okay? There's five populations, Dr. Katz was mentioning them, all over the globe, including the Seventh-day Adventists. They have the most centenarians, and they eat primarily a plant-based diet. More than 50% of their calories is from carbs, and they're the longest living populations. And I look at nutrition kind of like a symphony. You know, there's tons of interesting mechanisms. There's the violins, and there's the drums, and there's the trombones, and all the different parts, and there's the strings, this mechanism, that mechanism, and it all adds up together to make a big symphony. And it's important to learn about all those parts, and we have a ton more to learn. The microbiome alone is a hugely am amazing topic, which we don't know enough about yet. But if you look at the whole symphony, where it's all put together, that manif manifests as how people live. Populations, the blue zones. The blue zones represent, in my mind, the symphony. So let, but the Simon people also are another representation of the symphony. They're an indigenous population in Bolivia. Uh, and they analyze about 700 of them. They even ship down CAT scan machines to the jungles of Bolivia so they could take CAT scan pictures of their heart. It's pretty impressive. And they, that population has the lowest rate of heart disease ever recorded in the medical literature. Their diet, 72% carbs. Now, they're also very active, and it's whole grains. Um, and from a vascular age perspective, they are about... 20, pound for pound, they are 25 years younger than the average American. So uh, there are almost no hard outcomes with the ketogenic diet. And there are many side effects of a ketogenic diet. It's, it is a diet that can be helpful for refractory epilepsy. So there is a literature in the pediatric population. And the side effects include arrhythmias, cardiomyopathy, kidney stones, fractures, pancreatitis, vitamin deficiencies, and other things. So to me, the onus is on uh, that group to really prove safety. Um, what are some potential mechanisms of harm? Well, heme iron is a type of iron that's in red meat and some fish. That when you can, and plants have a, typically a different kind of iron. The heme iron in animal products is inflammatory, can promote heart disease, it can promote diabetes, possibly prostate cancer. New 5GC is a sialic acid that is on a sialic acid that is on the cell membranes of non-human primates. So when we eat red meat and even some fish, um, you consume new 5GC, which is foreign to us. It's not on our cells. Who cares? Well, when that happens, it can create inflammation. And in animal models, uh, even promotes cancer. The microbiome, eating more animal-based foods, selects for less healthful microbiome. And kind of like we went through, more inflammation, which can lead to a cascade of issues. Red meat, particularly cooked red meat, more advanced glycation end products, promotes inflammation, oxidative stress, diabetes. Animal products can increase LDL or the bad cholesterol. Antioxidants, on average, animal-based foods have 64 times fewer antioxidants than plant-based foods. Berries have about 90 times more than fish. And in a murine or mouse model, that they fed their usual chow, which is high in carb, a Western diet, and a low carb diet. They looked at how much cholesterol blockages they developed in the arteries in their body. And those eating the low carb diet developed the most cholesterol blockages. But you know what? They had similar blood pressures and similar weights between those different groups of mice. But then when they looked at more novel risk factors, ones we don't usually look, to, look at, like endothelial progenitor cells and non-esterified fatty acids, which promote inflammation, those were worse in the low-carb group. So it's much more than just blood pressure and cholesterol. There is a, a symphony of things that are going on. Um, why then do people even do uh, the weight, uh, ketogenic diet? Well, there, it can be helpful for weight loss. It is useful for short-term uh, weight loss, but so is cocaine. Um, 
Um, and when you eat a ketogenic diet, you, um, you don't need any glucose, so your glycogen stores leave your body and that holds water so you pee that out. The ketones themselves help you pee out water and you can get something called the keto flu which makes you feel a little crummy so you uh, don't eat it quite as much at first. But longer term studies show that there's less than a kilogram of weight loss difference between a ketogenic diet and higher carb lower fat diets. Um, and how about diabetes? Uh, so that's another reason that people will eat this and there is, um, but Keeping it short, a meta-analysis of long-term randomized controlled trials found no difference in sugar control in the ketogenic diet versus a higher carb, lower fat diet. And when you eat a ketogenic diet, you don't eat any sugar, so your blood sugar levels are gonna go down. But it doesn't necessarily reverse the underlying reason that you have diabetes in the first place, which is insulin resistance, which is from fat deposits in your liver and your muscles, making it harder for insulin to transport glucose from your blood into those places where they're supposed to be. But with a plant-based diet, despite eating more carbohydrates, you can uh, potentially, you can, in many cases, reverse Diabetes. So despite eating more carbs, you're reversing the diabetes and getting at the underlying reason. Because to me, reversing diabetes is not masking it, and then you go sit within six feet of a carbohydrate and your blood sugar shoots up. It's really getting at the underlying reason. And we need more data, but right now I'm not aware of any convincing data that a ketogenic diet actually reverses the underlying reason for diabetes. So we'll see. Time will tell. Um, epidemiologic or population studies, sh multiple population studies show the more, uh, the more toward a low carb diet you eat, the worse you do. And in one study of patients who survived heart attacks, about 5,000 heart attack survivors, those who were eating a low carb diet did worse, and those after their heart attack who shifted to an even more low carb diet did even worse. And you are leaving out some of the healthiest foods in the world when you go uh, on a ketogenic diet. You're leaving out whole grains. There was a meta-analysis just recently published in Lancet with 135 million person years of follow-up. And basically, the more whole grains you ate, the longer you lived, the less heart disease you had, and the less diabetes. Yes, the more whole grains you ate, the less diabetes you had. Nuts. Uh, uh, pulses, beans, and lentils. The more of those you eat, it's associated with living longer. And fruits are among the healthiest foods in the world. And in this incredible analysis by Dr. Dew, they asked, if you eat more fresh fruit, is it associated with doing better, doing worse? What happens? Well, the more, and this is in almost 500,000 people with something like 4 million person years of follow-up the more fresh fruit you ate, the less likely you were to develop diabetes. I'm kind of getting tired of hearing how fruit causes diabetes. <laughs> and if you had diabetes when this study started, and they had 30,000 people who did, if you had diabetes when the study started, and you ate more fresh fruit, you did better. The more fresh fruits you had, despite having diabetes at the beginning, the better you did. The longer you lived, the fewer macro and micro vessel complications, meaning fewer heart attacks, less kidney disease, less eye disease, eating more fresh fruit. Um, and they did a wonderful and other analysis. More fresh fruit was associated with less stroke, less heart disease. And accordingly, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists recommends a plant-based diet for patients with diabetes. So for a ketogenic diet, no long living population is in chronic ketosis. I'm not aware of any heart outcomes like heart attack or stroke. We need more safety data. Epi and mechanistic studies do not support benefits and suggest harm. And you are giving up some of the healthiest foods in the world. So if you look, this is a nutrition table. So these are plant-based foods versus Mediterranean versus a more ketogenic diet for 500 calories. These are plant-based, Mediterranean, keto. The plant-based is equal parts tomato, spinach, lima bean, peas, and potatoes. Mediterranean is 40% of all that. 
and then a uh, half a piece of skinless chicken, one teaspoon of olive oil, and one cup of 1% milk. And the ketogenic diet is e equal parts uh, other stuff. <laughs> it's equal parts beef, pork, chicken, and whole milk. And as you can see, cholesterol goes up the more animal products you eat. You don't need to eat a drop. Your body makes all you need. Protein is a little higher in the Mediterranean style arm, but you don't need to eat anywhere near that much. You can ask all the, the plant-based bodybuilders. Um, beta carotene, it's subtle, dietary fiber, your constipation will go away. Um, and you can see all the other nutrients trend toward benefit with a plant-based diet. Thank you. So um, got five minutes left. This is a great comic. Halfway through his hearty man breakfast, Dwayne thought he heard some of his smaller arteries slamming shut. And Dwayne's right. And I think this is interesting for a couple of reasons. The first reason is this whole notion of a hearty man, which I think has been changing. It used to be cigar smoking, steak eating guy, which is of course the exact opposite of what you need to do if you actually want to be hearty. But also he heard some of his smaller arteries slamming shut. He's right. Dwayne is right. And in very interesting studies by Dr. Vogel, he found in young, healthy men, if you fed them whole grain cereal, their arteries reacted normally. But if you fed them fatty foods, uh, processed fatty foods, their artery function didn't function normally. These are young, healthy men. And it took about six hours after the meal for their arteries to improve. But then you know what time it is. Then it's lunchtime, and it's chicken parmesan. And then it's dinner time and pizza, and it's meal after meal. It's like pounding away at those endothelial cells, and it's no wonder they give out over time. Um, but you know what? It doesn't just impact your blood vessel function, one unhealthy meal. One unhealthy meal impacts lung function. Asthmatics are more likely to get readmitted to the hospital because of their lungs, their, their breathing being worse. But it doesn't just impact your, heart your blood vessel function and your lung function. It also impacts liver function. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting great tips from the audience too. Um, one uh, unhealthy meal, non-alcoholic non fatty liver disease is the most common cause of liver failure now in the US, more than alcohol. Well, after one unhealthy meal, your liver metabolically looks like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and it goes away after about six hours, but that's one unhealthy meal. But it's not just your blood vessel function. It's not just your um, lung function, not just your liver function, it's your red blood cell function. Your red blood cells carry oxygen in your body, and they're, they're all very flexible, and they can get through all the small capillaries and all over the place. But when you eat one unhealthy meal, they can become spiky and less flexible. And when they're spiky and they don't move around so well, that can there's, a, there's an association with eating a big, fatty, heavy meal and then having a heart attack after that. It could be for many reasons, but one of them is that if that red blood cell is spiky and pokey, it can poke a hole in one of the cholesterol plaques in your arteries and create a heart attack just from that. So it's pretty impressive what one unhealthy meal can do. So this is leaving evidence-based medicine and going to eminence-based medicine. This is the past president of the American College of Cardiology, and he said, I recommend a plant-based diet because I know it's going to lower their blood pressure, improve their insulin sensitivity, meaning improving diabetes, and decrease their cholesterol. So a plant-based diet is most supported by epidemiologic and mechanistic studies, but a head-to-head -head trial with a Mediterranean-style diet would be interesting. Um, Mediterranean-style diet, the more plant-based the Mediterranean-style diet, it appears the better. And a ketogenic diet, we need more data, but there actually is some data that if you go more plant-based keto, that may be similar to control or slightly better. Uh, but um, it, it, we need more data, and it does appear to be associated with harm. Um, Eating for our own health is, of course, critically important. But the Eat Lancet study, which convened scientists from across the globe, said that, yeah, eating more plant-based is good for our own health. But of course, it's good for pop the, the environment as well. And who really cares how healthy we are if there's no planet? No planet, no health. Doesn't really matter. Um, and then from a cost perspective, there was a modeling study done in the UK and Belgium where they found that if people went even a bit more plant-based, they could save billions of dollars. Uh, and I was going to talk a bit about our program, but I think I'm running out of time. I'm in the Bronx at Montefiore. Uh, we have a, an outpatient arm, an inpatient arm. 
uh, an educational arm and a research arm for our plant-based program. We work with patients and our system to help adopt it. I'll say a very couple, couple quick things and I'll end it. Um, we, um, as part of our clinical arm, we have these Saturday morning sessions where we work with patients to help them adopt a plant-based diet. They're four hours long. We fund it all through donations. I don't charge patients for it at all. We have a large indigent patient population where we are. So I want to democratize this information as much as possible. In our inpatient arm, we have the documentary film, Forks Over Knives, playing on continuous loop in the hospital, and all the inpatient TVs with, with, a, with Spanish subtitles. And we have plant-based meals that you can order for uh, inpatients. Uh, and also they're served in our cafeterias, so the staff can have them uh, as well. And Montefiore's gone meatless Mondays recently as well. From an education standpoint, we have our, a number of things, but our big annual conference coming up um, on November 2nd, and we'd love to have you all there. We're going to have cards out front with information about it. Registration is open, and if you go through mecme.org and you look for November 2nd, you can find uh, our, our conference. So thank you very much. Um, we have time for two questions. So if folks in the audience have a question, yes, ma'am in the back. My name is Donna. Uh, so the question on uh, diabetes. So it is it's like a concern now, which type of diabetes are we talking about that plant-based can help? Is it type one, type two, or it can help anyone? So because it's a back and forth thing, you know, because I'm assuming it's type two diabetes you're talking about, but I know within my, my community, you know, there are folks who say, well, I have type one and I'm dependent on insulin. That's not doing anything for me. So how can we address that? The answer to your question is yes. It is helpful for both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Um, there's evidence in patients who have type 1 diabetes, the more low carb they go, it's associated with more uh, cholesterol disease and blood vessels in the body. Uh, you also derive a myriad of benefits uh, from uh, eating more plant-based when you're type 1 diabetic. All the other benefits come through. It's not, it not necessarily going to fix type 1 diabetes because your beta cells that make the, pan the insulin are gone but it can make you much more helpful and it may lower your, your insulin requirements. And there's a wonderful uh, company, uh, I guess I'll say, they're called Mastering Diabetes. They both, they're uh, run by two wonderful people uh, and it's online and they help people with type 1 diabetes go more plant-based. I have no vested interest in them one way or, or the other. Um, but uh, at any rate, uh, so the answer is yes. that are added, that's one thing. But the second, I just wanna ask you if you have a minute to comment on this. When I was doing HIV work, I used to use a lot of um, educational things and um, campaigns that used, quote, I was told, fear tactics. And the question is, in public health and population health, whether or not you think fear tactics is what they were called, so that if you showed people how animals were raised and what they were given and how they were slaughtered, whether or not you think that that would um, help people in terms of making the decision to go plant-based. Thank you. So in terms of, so thank you about asking about the types of plant-based food and truly it's minimally processed plant-based foods. So sugar cookies and white bread, that's plant-based, but no one's gonna argue that that's healthy. So it's, it's, it's whole grains, uh, vegetables, fruits, beans, lentils, chickpeas, peas, tofu, potatoes, um, foods like that. And what, what was the quote? You know, if it's uh, you know, made in a plant, don't eat it, but if it is a plant, eat it. Something like, I'm, I'm sure I'm massacring that quote. Um, and in terms of scare tactics with uh, you know, what happens to animals, I, it's not an area that I've pursued at all. Um, and you, you know, when, um, but that can be, you know, for some, for the ethics of um, consuming animals is a, is a very uh, impassioned topic for a lot of people and, and appropriately so. So for the appropriate audience, I think that would be something that might be helpful, but it's not something that I use in medical practice.
Thank you so much. That was, excuse me. That was fantastic, Dr. Osfeld. Now